Hello, and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show audio podcast. With your host, Kenneth Bacor. With my special guest, Spencer Wright, Electric Vehicle Society Kawartha Chapter President. Recorded via WebEx on October 28, 2018. All right, well, thanks and welcome to this edition of uh, the EV Revolution Show audio podcast number six already. Uh, of course, I'm Kenneth Bocor, your host. Uh, glad that you're tuning in and listening to this podcast, whether it be through iTunes, uh, your podcast app, or through this equivalent on your Android device through Google Play. Maybe you're listening to it on iTunes Radio if you can find it. I had a hard time finding it. And Spotify now that I'm on that as well. So uh, thank you very much for taking the time to listen. I've got a great uh, special guest with me today I want to introduce. I'm excited to have Mr. Spencer Wright all the way from lovely Peterborough, Ontario. How are you doing, Spencer? Good. How are you doing this morning, Ken? I'm excellent, excellent. You know, it's uh, it was nice to look out the window and see a little white stuff on the lawn there. Uh, <laughs> As long as you're prepared for it. <laughs> exactly. You know, and it's good good that you say that because one of our topics today is going to talk about preparing your EV and some things to consider for the winter uh, regards uh, from EV ownership. I've had a lot of people come up to me in the last few weeks doing some events and, and so forth, going to meetings. And uh, they asked me, gee, well, what should we do with our car? But before we get to that, I just want to give you an opportunity to let the folks uh, tell uh, to tell the folks who you are, what you do. I know that you, you're an EV owner, obviously and an advocate. You've got a 2018 Nissan Leaf, and we've shared some stories already on our lease. But you're also the uh, one of the chapter presidents for the Electric Vehicle Society here in Ontario. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so I... Uh... I first got introduced to EVs around uh, 2014s, technically when I owned my first one, but at that point it was uh, a zero motorcycle, so a fully electric motorcycle. Um, And I had that for a few years, but then decided that uh, I wanted to have an EV as my main source of transportation, not just as my uh, side toy. So, Mm -hmm. um, So I sold that and started saving up for what I thought was going to be a Model 3. Um, but then when I heard, uh, the specs and that on the 2018 leaf, I basically put down a deposit on that and the model three and just said I would get whichever came in first. Mm -hmm. Um, so I ended up taking delivery of the first 2018 leaf in Peterborough. So that was late February. I believe it was, uh, February 26th. So I was number 50 in all of Canada. Wow. Um, Wow, and then, awesome. yeah. yeah, and then around the same time, I started up the uh, local chapter, so the Kawartha chapter of the EV Society. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we basically just run monthly meetups to help educate the public on the benefits of EVs or uh, if there are new EV owners, um, getting them information sort of like we're doing right now. Mm-hmm. As far as uh, the different benefits to their vehicle, the learning curves, that type of thing. Because um, especially with the the LEAF, there are a lot of them that uh, started to be adopted this year because of the increase in range. Um, right. I know just at our local dealership, they did about 52 2018 LEAFs this year. So wow. um, compared to other vehicles on the market and uh, other years prior, I know that's a significant uptick in adoption. So it's a good thing to see. Absolutely is. And when you mentioned that you had a reservation on the Model 3, was that for the standard range version you were waiting for? Uh, yeah, my ideal configuration would have just been the standard range, but also the dual motor. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So just for the, when it did come out in June, I mean, obviously I had already had the Leaf for a few months at that mm-hmm. point anyways. Mm-hmm. Um, I should specify June for Canada. Yeah. Um, so I just... For for the amount of money it was going to be anyways um, to get like the rear wheel drive and like if I'm going to be spending over sixty thousand dollars I want to get the exact configuration that I want right not mm-hmm. the only one that's available. Yep. Um, I do quite a bit of travel. My parents are in Huntsville, so uh, some northern Ontario trips. So for me, having the uh, the all wheel drive as opposed to just the rear wheel drive, mm-hmm. I realize it's not essential, but it definitely would have been preferred. 
Right. And you know, you make a good point there of, of if you're going to pay a little bit more of a premium price for something, you want to be able to get what you want. And, exactly. Uh, you know, and we know that uh, I've talked to a lot of Model 3 owners and we won't spend a lot of time on this topic, but they love the cars and they're great. But again, so there's a lot of people that are still waiting for a specific configuration that uh, that they want uh, for many reasons. And, uh, you know, it's certainly worth waiting for if, if you're going to spend that kind of money. So you, you got the Leaf. You're one of the first ones in your area. I, I know that I was uh, not as early as you. I got mine and in, in put order in in February and got it in May. And I got notification that I was like number 800 and something in, in all of Canada. So I, I was within the, t- the first 1,000 of the yeah. that were delivered in Canada, which I thought was pretty cool. But it's, you know, it's interesting you make a point about um, you, your initial need being all-wheel drive. And let's dive right into that subject about winter driving um, and some of the parameters there because you know, your, your interest was to look at an all-wheel drive vehicle because you, you do go f- quite frequently into more you know, two-lane highways and, and smaller road areas and winter conditions. Now, but, yet, but you have the LEAF. So how, and you have gone through a bit of a winter already on the LEAF. So let's talk about some of that experience and then your, your take on, on, on getting ready for the winter and when you, when you have an electric vehicle, especially an all-electric vehicle, what are some of the things we should be thinking about? Um, so yeah, I, I obviously had a bit of an exposure to uh, Canadian winter having gotten it in February. It was a bit of a warm stall when I picked it up, but uh, mm-hmm. for anyone else in Ontario, you know that that's never going to last if it's still just <laughs> February. Oh yeah. It, well, every day now, Mother Nature's throwing something different at us all over the world, so it's not just here in Canada. Yeah, so I uh, I was very impressed with um, with how it handled in the snow. Now, I don't use uh, dedicated snow tires. When I first got the vehicle, I switched uh, the tires out for the Nokian all-weather tires. Mm -hmm. Uh, So they basically still have the snow tire rating, but they're designed to be used all year round. Mm -hmm. So they don't have uh, quite the same performance as a dedicated snow tire, but for me, they just work well uh, from a convenience point of view. Mm -hmm. Um, But as far as the handling and everything, one of the things I was very... Um, interested to see how it reacted was the e-pedal in low traction conditions. Um, but it, it's very interesting how it basically, if it detects any wheel slippage, it shuts off the regen, mm-hmm. but it switches right to friction braking. So the it feels the same, um, but uh, it, it'll still perform using the standard brakes and ABS if required. Right. And of course, most uh, modern cars now have versions of traction control and and Nissan is Mm -hmm. different than than the others, for sure. Well, Mm -hmm. that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I'm a big believer in in winter tires, but we'll get to that in a sec. Now, I know that you've you've talked publicly about uh, getting ready for winter, but let's talk about what are the benefits of of an electric vehicle over, you know, an ICE V comparable vehicle in the winter? Because most people would think that, well, I'm going to run out of I'm going to run out of electricity sooner. I mean, my range goes down, right? And we, I think you and I can both confirm that, um, you know, in basic stats, that uh, a battery electric vehicle's range could go anywhere from 30 to maybe even 50% uh, of a loss in range during the, the really cold winter months when we get down to, you know, minus 10, minus 20, minus 30 C or minus 10 Fahrenheit temperatures. Um, so people can get, they would think that an EV is not that advantageous in the winter, but uh, uh, tell us and, and, and my listeners why uh, that's actually the opposite. Yeah, that is a very good point, Ken, because I would say out of everyone I talk to, that's the number one concern is they don't think electric vehicles will work in the winter at all. Mm-hmm. Um, but like you said, they actually do have, in my opinion, quite a few advantages over uh, a traditional internal combustion vehicle. Um, the big one that I notice, I have a very short commute. Um, so the, the vehicle I was driving before was a Prius. And when it was minus 20 mm-hmm. outside, um, even if I started the car five minutes before I left for work, one of the downsides with the Prius is the engine so efficient that it hardly produces any waste heat. <laughs> so it would never, it yeah. would never warm up by the time I got to work. Right. Um, with the leaf literally before I've even if I don't precondition it at all um, before I've driven a full city block it's already blowing out hot air because with the electric heater there's no uh, internal combustion engine that has to warm up before it can get start giving you heat mm-hmm. so I would say that's definitely the biggest advantage um, 
especially because there are a lot of people that do like short city drives and that. Mm hmm. Um, 100% just to throw my two cents it hasn't really been that cold yet we've got down to you know zero degree temps maybe a minus one on a couple of days here but you know certainly in the single digits and I can attest that just you know it, it heats up uh, my leaf and, and I know all all especially bevs in particular I heat up extremely fast uh, I know that the leaf uses a heat pump uh, when the temperatures are above a certain range I think it's 8c or something and then of course your your ceramic or resistive heaters uh, a little bit more of a draw but yeah within a minute I mean this thing is just blowing out hot air really quick and find I find that I have to turn it down uh, relatively soon after it warms up because it gets that that hot mm-hmm yeah, and I mean, of course, you for almost any electric vehicle on the market, they have some sort of connectivity option. So you can either uh, preheat or pre-cool your vehicle from your phone. Um, or if you bought, I know like the base version of the Leaf, for example, it doesn't have that connectivity, but mm -hmm. you can still set up a timer in the car for the climate control. So say you start work at nine every morning and leave at 20 to nine you can have it set so that at 8 30 um, your heat will automatically come on um, which will make it even more comfortable so you don't even have to wait the minute to get heat by the time you get in the car it's already warm and ready to go for you that's right um, and that in fact that feature is available on most electric vehicles today the, yeah the teslas exactly uh, the hyundai Ionix and, and the list of eagles everything that's pretty well standard nowadays for at least if the in-car programming part is yeah so even if they don't have the app feature mm -hmm. you can still typically just set it up in car um, mm -hmm. and for anyone that's on a regular routine that would work just as well because yeah. sometimes if you're really busy in the morning you can even forget to precondition too so <laughs> you've done that yes already yeah Mm -hmm. So I would say definitely the the heat is the the largest um, advantage that they would have. Obviously, that can be a little bit of a draw as well, both literally and figuratively, um, mm -hmm. as far as power goes. But uh, that immediately affects your range also. So mm -hmm. that's why I always recommend preheating um, while your vehicle is still plugged in at home, because that way you're not going to be eating up the battery um, to warm the car up. And I find, especially with my vehicle, like once the cabin is heated up, it takes very little power to actually maintain that heat. Um, so even in temperatures like minus five, minus 10, um, I find the heaters usually using one and a half kilowatts or less after the cabin's actually been warmed up. Um, it's, it's quite efficient at maintaining that heat. So if right. you can do the bulk of the heating while you're still plugged into uh, to the wall, then uh, it's not going to affect your range nearly as bad. Good, great point, absolutely. And, and folks, the temperatures that we quote are Canadian in Celsius, uh, so you'll have to do some conversion there into Fahrenheit if you, for those countries that use that scale. Now, what other benefits does an EV have besides the the instant heat and the ability to precondition? Uh, so one of the other big factors is the traction control that they're able mm -hmm. to build into these vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, I personally know a lot of people, uh, they turn the traction control off on their vehicles because they find that it can almost make it uh, feel like they're about to get stuck rather than help prevent them get stuck because all it does is kill your power and slam on the brakes as soon as you start to slip. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the reasons why an EV is better at that is with a combustion vehicle, you have all of this inertia um, going from the pistons in the engine through the crankshaft, through the drive line. So you have all of this stuff building up to put power to the wheels. Um, so in order to slow down any spinning, it basically has to cut that whole process and apply brakes to the wheels. Interesting. With yeah. an EV, um, since everything's basically digitally or computer controlled, as soon as it detects wheel slippage, it can basically just flip a switch like that and cut the power. There, it doesn't have to uh, cut the fuel flow and then wait for all these other processes to stop. It's much more instant. Um, so mm. it's a lot more responsive to the conditions. So yeah, I have a lot of times where people will think that... Um, 
like they're flooring it and they're like, oh, why isn't the car going? But um, it'll limit the power just to the exact amount that traction allows. So mm. you, you could literally be on an icy hill and just be flooring it and the tires aren't going to be spinning. They'll just go as much as the traction allows to get you up that hill. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a bit of an adjustment to get used to that feeling, but it is much more uh, effective um, at keeping you in control. Oh, um, and that sort of ties right into uh, the weight of the vehicles as well. Mm -hmm. So um, obviously every battery electric vehicle has a very large battery in it uh, to provide the propulsion power. Um, but that is a very heavy component of the vehicle as well. I mean, in most of them, it's going to be close to a thousand pounds. Um, now that's not always apparent when you're driving in good conditions because electric vehicles are so torquey that um, they, they actually feel quicker than most other vehicles, even though they do have the extra weight. That's where um, we get our EV, EV smiles from. Exactly. Well, that's <laughs> work, yeah. <laughs> so when you are, um, when you are driving in low traction scenarios, that weight can be advantageous in that uh, if there's a lot of powdery snow in that, it'll sort of help you get down to, uh, to more stable ground and grip through it. Um, but at the same time, if you're on like a uh, very icy road, um, you do still have to slow that extra weight down. So um, you, you can almost get a false sense of confidence. So you do need to remember that you are driving a vehicle that's quite, uh, quite heavy and can require some extra distance to, uh, to slow down. But that's right. obviously winter tires are going to help with that as well. Yeah, I was going to add my two cents into there. I, I'm a big proponent of, of winter tires, especially in areas where you may find yourself out of, of urban areas, um, you know, in smaller areas that may not get it plowed, first plowed as quickly, and second, that may accumulate a little bit more snow than some of the other areas. Um, if you're just booting around a major, you know, city center area, you, you know, you could probably go all seasons all year in those kind of environments. But when you get outside of that, um, just even for safety, just to have that extra safety measure of being able to stop sooner and, and navigate a little bit more icy conditions when they when they arise. Yeah, the argument of like, oh, I have like whether it's someone with an SUV or a truck or whatever, but I have all wheel drive. I don't need snow tires. I'm like <laughs> Every vehicle has brakes on all four wheels. It's it's not the going that I'm ever concerned with. It's the stopping. Mm -hmm. So um, just because you have four wheel drive doesn't mean that you don't need extra traction when you're slowing down. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Now you mentioned the weight of the battery pack. So obviously they contribute. And you know, you and I both know that it offers more of a lower center of gravity to. to mm -hmm. help. How does that? Uh, how is that a benefit in in more wintry conditions? Mm -hmm. Um, well, it's basically just going to make the entire vehicle feel a lot more stable, not mm -hmm. just in winter conditions, but in any conditions. Mm -hmm. um, but I find that that's just going to be amplified in winter conditions where you want um, you want your vehicle to basically feel as stable so that you can drive confidently um, as possible. So like if you're on a one of those roads where it hasn't really been plowed, but it's slushy and it's sort of pulling you every which way. Um, I find that just the extra weight and the low center of gravity can make that feel much less uh, sketchy and just mm -hmm. helps you get through. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And just cornering and everything, right? Um, That's right. I mean... I don't think there's a, a single bad thing about having a lower center of gravity on any vehicle. That's no, typically that's what, uh, what anyone strives for. So <laughs> that's right. Now also, uh, I think with batteries, we, because of that skateboard design, you know, it gives you that low center of gravity. And for listeners that may not understand what, what I mean by that skateboard design is that having the battery in the floor between the two axles, the, the two uh, wheels, um, is that, you know, that, basic design, but it also contributes to the weight distribution. And, and as you said, there's a lot of uh, engineering and thought that goes into uh, designing and, and, and uh, building sports cars that want low center, center of gravity. And a lot of them talk about 50-50 and you know, 49-51 energy or weight distribution, and, but we actually get that uh, with an EV as a benefit, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, as we were talking about the Model 3 earlier and how I would ideally like the uh, 
the all-wheel drive version. I do still understand that a, uh, a rear-wheel drive electric vehicle is going to be much better in um, winter conditions or low traction conditions than a traditional rear-wheel drive vehicle because of that weight distribution. Mm -hmm. Typically, people are wanting, um, they think front wheel drive will be better, both because it's pulling you through the snow instead of pushing you, but also you have all the weight from the engine over Mm -hmm. top of the wheels, so you have this extra traction. Mm -hmm. Um, As you just said, with the skateboard design, you basically have a battery that goes from the front axle to the rear axle of the vehicle, so your, uh, your weight is very evenly distributed and very low. Um, so that combined with the, uh, the more effective traction control that I was speaking to, um, it actually does make the, the rear wheel drive version still very good, uh, Mm -hmm. in snow conditions compared to, like I said, um, a lot of people think of like when they see trucks driving around that are just sort of fishtailing all over the place. Mm -hmm. Um, they have very little weight in the back end and probably no traction control turn on whatsoever. (laughs) So Um, I have been in a few Teslas that are rear wheel drive, um, in some pretty hairy winter conditions. And I mean, you can definitely detect slippage, but at no point does it feel unsafe. Mm. So, um, so yeah, the weight distribution there can play a big factor. Obviously it's not going to quite compare to having all wheel drive, but, um, Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't rule it out if that is something that you're looking at. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, and uh, on the flip side, I've driven front wheel drive cars for a couple of decades because I'm going to age myself here. You know, I'm not the youngest guy on the planet um, and I've, I've never, ever got stuck anywhere in front wheel drive cars. Um, no. Nope. So, I mean, th- there's something to be said about that. And, and in, a, in a BEV, if you look at the, the Leaf, I mean, yes, it's got it's got the, the uh, charger, the inverter and the motor all on the front that adds uh, probably about 300 pounds, if I if, I, if my math, you know, 250 to 300 pounds there of, for that weight. But you've got, you know, the way they've they've got the battery pack, it's a bit more rear end loaded on the battery pack than it is front end loaded. So I think that does give it a little bit better weight distribution. I don't know what the stats are on the Leaf, but uh, so even in this case with the front wheel drive, you've got some weight there to to assist mm-hmm. with traction. Yeah, and I'm not sure exactly what the uh, the weight distribution is either, but I think nearly all of the uh, the electrics are fairly close to 50-50. Which is the um, ideal situation. Yeah, again, just because of the battery there being mm-hmm. the main bulk of the weight. That's right. And there's a couple other things that a lot of people uh, take advantage of, and I know they, they've they look for that as options or standard features now, especially on electric cars, because it can be so convenient as things like heated seats and the steering wheels, right? You, you probably use that on yours? Oh, yes. <laughs> I, about this time of year, I have the heated seat basically just switched on constantly at this point on low, but mm-hmm. um, it's always nice to have the heated steering wheel kick on when you precondition in that as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I know it is mar- making its way more into a lot more vehicles on the market, but it almost does seem like um, electric vehicles are sort of what started that push. I mean, yes. the the first Nissan Leaf in like 2011 had heated front and rear seats and a heated steering wheel. And before that, I mean, um, you'd be looking at cars from Mercedes and that like you're S-Class, top of the line, to get heated steering wheels in that, right? Whereas mm-hmm. now, they're offering it on Honda Civics and everything. So mm-hmm. um, I, I could be wrong, but I almost feel like uh, EVs are sort of what helped to bring that down more to the mass market scale. I totally agree with you. And, uh, you know, it's something that I didn't think I really cared about. Like, I, I, I the heated seats, yes, more so for my wife and daughter. Uh, they enjoy that um, steering wheel. I don't really. I, I have. I, I'm not really a big fan of that yet. But I haven't gone through a winter. But I do like you. I am finding myself using the heated uh, seat every day um, on low. And then what what that means is that I actually keep my cabin temperature a little low because I don't feel as cold as maybe I normally would without that. So you know, I'm, I'm adjusting my cabin temperature to like 19, 19 and a half, maybe 20 if I really at these temperatures. I mean, when we get to minus 10, minus 15. It'll have to be a little warmer, but it'll be interesting to see um, uh, uh, what happens there. Now, when you talked about the weight um, uh, and that weight distribution, I mean, how does that compare to some of the other vehicles on the market? And you mentioned four-wheel drive and all-wheel drive as well. 
Yeah, so I've done like just a rough comparison. Um, I mean, it's it's hard to put an exact uh, number to it just because mm -hmm. in all of the different vehicles there are different trim levels, right? So I mean, mm -hmm. within with one within one vehicle lineup, there are um, multiple different curb weights that you can be looking at. Um, but just like looking at a Range Rover Sport, for example, versus um, a Model X uh, 100D, so the 100 kilowatt hour battery, mm -hmm. um, a Range Rover, you're looking at about 4,800 pounds as far as the curb weight goes on it. With the Model X, you're looking at about 5,400, just over mm -hmm. 5,400. So mm -hmm. 600 pounds extra on basically the same size vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, Again, like the numbers would indicate the, the Tesla is faster, but um, so it wouldn't necessarily feel like you're hauling around an extra 600 pounds. But uh, when you get into an emergency braking scenario, um, you can't really cheat the laws of physics in that case. That's um, right. And then, I mean, there isn't necessarily a direct comparison, I wouldn't say, to a Leaf like you and I are driving, but in Nissan's lineup, they do have the Verso, which is just mm -hmm. another small hatchback. Mm -hmm. um, the Leaf's obviously a bit more upscale and a bit more spacious. Yes. But with a Versa, they're just shy of uh, 2,500 pounds mm. for curb weight. The Leaf's just shy of 3,500, so you're looking at 1,000 pounds difference there. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Um, and again, like the Leaf's a quicker vehicle than a Versa, but um, but yeah, you you just want to always keep that in mind that uh, you don't want to get uh, too big for your britches when you're driving around all confident <laughs> with your snow tires. Exactly, exactly. They do they do help, but you've got to have that uh, degree of uh, safetyness at the back of your mind. So well, uh, and like you said, if it is your first winter going mm -hmm. into it. Um, just err on the side of caution until you're familiar with what the car is capable of and the, the conditions, because it is easy to get a false sense of confidence driving around. Very good point. Very good. Which point. is why we always see all of the accidents on the very first big <laughs> snowfall of the year, right? Yeah, people tend to, we just tend to forget, you know, after the nice uh, hot summer, and I think most of the world has experienced a very hot and dry summer season this year. Yeah, um, it's going to be tough to get back into those snowy, uh, slippery road uh, condition weathers. That's for sure. And we talked a little bit about, you know, range reduction because of the temperatures uh, in winter, but um, can you dive in a little bit more about things that can help uh, or things that can impact range in EVs in the winter? Yeah, so I would definitely say the biggest one is uh, is running your cabin heat based on the outside temperature. Um, so as I had mentioned, like if you do precondition from the wall power um, initially before you leave on your trip, that's going to help because the the most energy intensive part of warming up your car is taking it from minus 20 to plus 20 right inside the cabin once it is plus 20 it doesn't really require a lot of heat um, or a lot of power to maintain that heat but in most of the electric vehicles on the market the batter or the heater in them can draw anywhere from the least around six kilowatts max the Bolt, I believe, is 9 kilowatts, and mm -hmm. with some of the Teslas, you can be up to 12 kilowatts. Okay. So just for comparison's sake, like at zero degree temperatures, if I'm cruising with my leaf set at 90 uh, kilometers an hour, um, I'm using between about 12 and 15 kilowatts. Mm -hmm. So if you're running a heater that's robbing six kilowatts, that's basically 50% of the power that is going to the, uh, the drive motor is also going to the heater. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, uh, that's a very extreme case. I find in most cases, um, I'd be using three kilowatts or less once the, uh, the cabin's actually heated up. Mm -hmm. um, but that is definitely going to be your biggest uh, draw or biggest factor. On some of the vehicles as well, this isn't the case with our LEAF because it doesn't have the uh, active thermal management on the battery, but on Bolts and Teslas, they do have a battery heater as well. So if the temperature gets cold, it's not only running a heating element to keep you warm, it's also running a heating element to keep the battery warm. Um, mm -hmm. And that's something you can't really control. 
Um, I thought I believe the Leaf does have a, a minimal battery heater as well at some point when it gets down really cold. Yeah, so it has a battery warmer, which warmer, is basically yeah. just like uh, an electric heating blanket. Um, mm -hmm. It's okay. quite minimal. It only draws about 300 watts, mm. um, and it only really kicks in. I've never seen it kick in on my car, but it only kicks in around minus 25. Oh, okay. um, and that's just to maintain the battery's temperature above minus 25 Celsius. Um, so that it doesn't do any permanent damage. Right, doesn't freeze. But up. again, that's that's when the battery temperature reaches minus twenty five. So, um, if you had been driving the vehicle, you would be probably parking with a battery that's above freezing. So, mm -hmm. it would have to be parked a considerable amount of time for it to actually get down to an internal temperature of that. Mm -hmm. That is a great point you bring up because I do talk to people sometimes that may not have the ability to. Well, either home charge consistently or even have a home charger or they, they, they just don't have a garage or anywhere to shield their car from those temperatures so they, they need to park it out overnight. Um, so there will be some obviously energy loss from the batteries if it's out in those really cold temperatures and then the battery warmer or heaters kick in. Um, mm -hmm. And there is a, a worry that if you're going to leave a car parked for an extended period of time in that situation, or an EV, uh, like maybe more than a week or a couple of weeks, that it actually could drain the battery enough to, to cause you some issues. Is that correct? I I don't have the exact experience to mm -hmm. uh, to speak to that, but I have had my car parked in freezing conditions, so like at zero for a week that I left it at the airport, and it only lost 2% over the course of a week. Okay. Um, so again, even at minus 20, I... Uh, I don't see it being a big issue. Um, I know with the previous Gen Leaf, I've I've seen of other people like in Alberta and that where mm -hmm. they left it unplugged outside for two weeks in minus twenty conditions, and it lost like maybe five percent. Oh, okay. um, but again, with I, this could vary with like a Bolt, for example. I'm not sure what it maintains the battery temperature at. Um, mm -hmm. But in the Leaf's case, like since that. Uh, battery warmer is such a minimal draw and only kicks in in such extreme conditions. Um, I don't think you'd really see a huge loss because mm -hmm. the reality is even uh, even just during the day, um, the the heat from the sun and the passive solar light coming into the cabin is probably going to warm it enough so that your battery isn't sitting at minus twenty five for multiple days consecutively. Right. That would be a very very extreme. Uh, <laughs> scenario that's right exactly but i hope we don't encounter i hope we don't get that that kind of arctic uh, fridge for a, for a long time and you know one point i do want to make out is a, uh, i travel a lot uh, throughout canada and some of the other areas and it's not uncommon to see in places like winnipeg and regina and some of the prairie provinces where you have they have block heaters everywhere in public parking spots so they're there for a reason because they do get those really frigid colds temperatures for longer periods of time or longer sustainabilities um, yeah. that they, you know, it's just, if you want your car to start when you come out from work, you just need to kind of keep it a little bit lukewarm. Yeah. And I mean, if that's the case, you can just even plug into mm -hmm. that with your level yes, right. one cord, right? Um, that's right. So Trickle charge. It's, it's actually handy if the cord's there. Yep. Um, I've never seen a scenario where an EV had problems starting in right. the, uh, cold weather, but, right. um, I mean, if it's going to help keep your battery warm by charging it a bit and, mm -hmm. uh, and give you an extra bit of juice. It's not a bad thing. Yeah, take advantage of. Now, when you and I talked about this before, you had mentioned something that I hadn't thought of was was something along the lines of air density having an impact on on reducing range. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so same as how your uh, your tires lose pressure as the uh, the temperatures drop. Basically, air becomes more dense. So. Mm -hmm. um, I think the the figures around like every six PSI that the temperature drops, or sorry, six degrees Celsius that the temperature drops, you'll lose one PSI. Mm -hmm. um, so when the air becomes more dense like that, it also requires more energy to displace it as you're driving through it. So I mean, this this isn't just applicable to gas vehicles; it's applicable to anything that's moving in. Uh, cold air but the colder the air is the more 
energy it's going to take to move it out of the way as you're pushing your car through it. Mm-hmm. So that also is uh, is going to be a factor into the range. Mm-hmm. That's right. So it's not just the the cabin heat that uh, is sucking your power, but it also mm-hmm. requires more energy just to move the car forwards when you're going at those highway speeds. Mm-hmm. So hence, if, uh, exactly as you said, if you're going on a longer trip, on more consistent highway speeds, you know your range will, will drop because again the energy to uh, to take it down or to move the car is going to be be more increased. And obviously, you know things like road conditions and it's you know bad roads or twisty roads or up and down hills, all that kind of stuff can come into play. Uh, slippery roads, things like that. Yeah, definitely. Um, I would say less so slippery roads, but mm-hmm. the big one I've noticed was. Um, it was around late March or early April, we had an ice storm and it was the point of year where they had sort of thought we were out of winter. So they'd pulled all the plows off the road and Mm. um, it just dropped ice pellets for an entire day straight. And there was probably like four to six inches of this. It was, it was really bizarre. It was like driving through sand. Um, But I was at my sister's place about uh, 60 kilometers away in Oshawa and uh, I figured it was fine like this I sort of wanted to take my car out because I wanted to see how it was in the bad weather so I drove there and on my drive back I was like round trip 120 kilometers like even cranking the heat like there's no way this can be a problem Um, I actually had to stop and charge at one of my friend's houses because I was, I wasn't going to make it home. My power consumption was like off the charts and it was Mm -hmm. basically just because I was having to push all of the snow out of the Mm -hmm. way because the roads weren't plowed at all. Mm -hmm. So my consumption was something like 35 kilowatt hours per hundred kilometers. Mm -hmm. And that was just with my cruise set at like 80, just trying to get home. So, Mm -hmm. um, nothing nothing as far as speed goes could have really helped me i don't think because it was just the fact that again i had to displace all that snow to push through it that's right um but it so that was definitely an eye-opening experience for me Hmm. yeah i wouldn't think about that and then add on top of that then i guess if if you do put winter tires on which which again i think you know it's a good thing to do to recommend now winter tires are designed to be sticky in the winter time to get better grip and 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 keep you uh, in and safe in those uh, slippery situations, but uh, that's going to add to your range too, right? Or we do help reduce your range a little bit. Yeah. So I would always, especially in the case of, uh, of having an electric vehicle, I would recommend like not cheaping out on your winter tires. Like if you are going to get them, um, get something that's quality and has like a fairly low rolling resistance. Um, Mm -hmm. The two tires that come to mind are, the Noki and Hakapolitas, but also the Michelin X Ices, they have a very mm-hmm. good uh, rolling resistance rating. Um, but if if it's to save like two hundred dollars on a set of tires, that's your only connection between uh, your vehicle and the yeah. road, um, and they're just going to be loud and howl all the time and cut your range by fifteen percent, um, then over five years, like that $200 was hardly worth saving. So yeah, totally agree with you. In fact, I was at an event yesterday in, in uh, Guelph and a lot of people were talking about, you know, asking about winter tires and what we recommend. And certainly I would consult uh, with which, whatever model car you have, be it Tesla or GM or Hyundai or, or Nissan or whatever, consult with your, your dealer and look at the, the, or the recommendations or go, go online and check them out. But I think most of the tires that you mentioned, certainly the, the Michelins, um, the, um, uh, the blizzards, uh, the Bridgestone blizzards, have a great series as well, which are highly rated and, and low resistance. So there's a few set, you know, a few top brands there uh, that are probably going to fit most of the EV needs. And I agree with you. I wouldn't, you know, for a couple hundred bucks more, three, four, even three, four hundred, I think it makes a huge difference. And at the end of the day, folks, um, this is, you know, it's safety, right? It's you want to get the best grip in those worst situations that you possibly can. You want to give yourself the best chance. Even if they only come up maybe once a winter season, you're, you just happen to get caught in something, that extra few hundred dollars could, could make a huge difference. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it'll be less than one insurance claim, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Now, don't be like me because I won't be able to do it now since I have the Leaf, uh, which has a, an electronic parking brake. But I usually like to, you know, to find an empty mall sometimes on a Sunday and uh, and do do donuts here and there when we get a nice snow. But I won't I won't be doing that kind of driving style uh, anymore in the winter. But certainly we do have to take that into account, right, on how we drive in the winter as far as range. Mm-hmm. For sure. Great. Now, uh, so we talked about things that can that can hamper range, but what about uh, techniques then to try to help uh, increase or maximize the range that we do get uh, with these winter temperatures and conditions? What what could, can people do? Um, so the the motto that I always like to follow is a warm battery is a happy battery. Um, <laughs> yeah, good one. I won't get into the scientific part of it too much, but. Mm-hmm. Um, all other factors aside, if if the internal temperature of your battery is very cold, um, it can actually hold less power and it's less efficient. Mm-hmm. Um, or I shouldn't say power, but less energy and it is less efficient. So you will notice like in very cold temperatures, even now you might be noticing it already, but um, your regen will become limited. Um, mm-hmm. And in some extreme cases, the power uh, that the car can put out is actually limited as well. And that's because of the battery temperature. Mm-hmm. Um, so one of the best ways to get around that is if you know that you are going on a long trip, set up your charging so that the car only finishes charging within about an hour of you leaving for your trip. That way... Um, well, two things, you're not going to have your battery sitting at 100% for hours or days on end, um, which isn't the best thing either. But also, when you charge the battery, um, just the act of charging uh, generates heat. So the battery will still be warm when you go to leave for your trip. Mm-hmm. Um, now, less of a, an impact than... Um, then could be useful, but the battery, since it is under the uh, floor of the cabin, if that's warm, it's also obviously going to be a good insulator for keeping the cabin warm. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it's going to make it so that your battery's running at the most uh, or a more optimal temperature as soon as you start your drive, instead of it having to uh, warm up while you're driving. Right. Now, what about for folks? Well, certainly, if I use the new leaf as an example, they've they've taken away the feature to set a, a charging stop limit of like 80% or something like that. So if you plug it in, you just it's just going to keep going until it's 100 or to you, unless you set a timer to, to stop and end at a certain time frame. So it's a little bit more challenging than if you wanted to kind of um, uh, get to stopping your charging before an hour of your trip uh, departing. It could be a little bit more challenging in that case. Yeah, so what I usually do, um, if it's like if I'm leaving for a, a trip, like say it's on a weekend and I'm leaving around lunch or something, I'll just sort of I, I'll charge up to a certain point the day before mm-hmm. and then I'll just finish the rest in the morning. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'll charge from say like 70 or 80 to 100 the next mm-hmm. morning. Um, I've been doing a bit of work outside of town this week and that's what I've been doing is I'll charge to 80% the night before. And then in the morning, basically when I get up, I'll just, uh, plug my car in. And then when I leave in two hours time, it's full. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, it's, it's not going to generate as much heat as doing a full charge. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the same time, we're not dealing with the same extreme temperatures. Like we're still around zero to five in the mornings right now. Mm-hmm. Yep. Excellent. So we talked about, yeah, I'm a big believer in the preconditioning and I think that's a great aspect that EVs have over. Yeah. So again, EVs, just yeah. do that when you're plugged yeah. in still and, yep. um, and then you're leaving with a hundred percent battery charge, a warm battery and a warm cabin. Yep. And if you just do those two things, I mean, that's going to make pretty well your biggest difference that you could Absolutely. Now we talked about seat heaters and, and uh, steering wheel heaters earlier on. That you know they don't draw a lot of energy from the battery, so they're a good use of alternative heating if you have those equipped in your vehicles. Definitely. Um, and uh, I had mentioned that just in my personal experience, I find right now with these temperatures that I'm not needing to heat the cabin 
as hot as I maybe normally would in, in an ice V uh, vehicle. Uh, I don't know, I guess because of the seat heaters and maybe it's just a perception thing uh, or because, of, as you said, some of the insulating factors with the pack being on the floor and, and different things combined. It just seems to be working a little bit uh, easier in, in those aspects. Mm hmm. Yeah, one of the, so to put a number to it, like using, if you had all of the seat heaters turned on and your steering wheel heater in that, you're looking at like maybe a couple hundred watts mm. tops. Mm -hmm. um, so considerably less than like running your, your cabin heat. Um, mm -hmm. I've, I've read of a, a few cases where people are uh, in their, their very first, uh, range anxiety scenario with an EV and they're, they're like shutting off the radio and turning off their headlights and stuff like that. But I mean, as I had said, to drive at 80 kilometers an hour, 90 kilometers an hour is using around 12 to 15,000 Watts. Right. So shutting off your radio is maybe going to save 50 Watts. If you yeah. were listening to it really loud, like all of these things are so yeah. trivial that you, you would maybe get an extra 50 feet out of your charge. Um, right. So the, the most efficient way to stay warm and comfortable is definitely going to be um, using your seat heaters and your steering wheel heater. If you are in a scenario where you think um, you could be tight for range, mm -hmm. um, that'll be more efficient than, running the uh the cabin heat usually what i'll do is i'll start out a trip with my heat set fairly low so say it's set at like 18 or 19 with my seat heaters on mm -hmm. and i'll drive fairly conservatively as far as speed goes in that and if halfway through my drive i realize oh i still have 60 percent charge left then i'll start turning the heat up a bit and like pick up my speed and whatnot. Like once I'm confident that I can get where I'm going without issue. Right. Um, yeah. Playing it safe Good. that way is a better way to do it than um, just drive without a care in the world and get three quarters of the way there and be like, Oh, I have 10% left. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now what? Exactly. So you, you just want to have that mental uh, game going, I guess, where you, you know how far you're going. If, it is a long trip where you think you'll be pushing the range, you know what your charging options are along the way and just sort of do the mental math. If you're going 200 kilometers and you've gone 60 kilometers and you're at 50%, that's a problem. <laughs> exactly. You know, and, and it's nothing different than what we do today on, on BEVs anyway, when we yep. do plan longer trips or trips that we think are going to, are going to tax the range. We, we do, there's a bit more pre-planning and that's just the nature of, of EV ownership. And certainly it, the same is going to go in the winter when you do have decreased range, you're going to have to think about it a little bit more, but on the flip side, as you said, you don't need to make your, make your experience an uncomfortable experience either. You've got options to keep the heat down, maybe a little lower, but you see heater steering wheel heaters. If you don't have a seat here, you can go out and buy one of the ones that plug into the 12 volt and, and use that again, it's going to draw a lot less than, than anything else. So there are techniques that you can use. So, cause uh, sometimes I talk to people, especially earlier on and they say, yeah, I mean, I'm freezing in my car, but that's because I want to get to my destination. But I don't think you need to really make yourself uncomfortable in driving your car. Uh, cause you, you know, again, you want to be able to get into it and be comfortable and drive in those more, uh, uh, serious elements of winter, especially the cold. So there are things that you can do to uh, to maximize that. Yeah, I'm very much for uh, driving in comfort. Like yeah. I would, I would much sooner. Uh, I don't deal well with the cold, so I would much <laughs> sooner stop for yeah. an hour to charge somewhere and grab a coffee and a bite to eat, mm -hmm. um, and keep my heat set comfortably for the entire drive right. than to. Uh, drive for two and a half hours with my heat turned off and like scraping at the windshield with mm -hmm. my fingernails to try yeah. and see <laughs> out of it um, exactly. just so that I can do my drive without stopping. Um, yeah. That's That doesn't sound enjoyable to me. No, it doesn't to me either, but there are some people that like that. And, you know, certainly you have the capability to do that. Um, so, you know, certainly uh, it's choice for everybody. Now, what we talked about tires before and the stickiness of tire, but but it, it's always important. And that's with, with any car, really. Uh, also making sure that your tires pressures are, are at, the, at the right uh, 
uh, mm-hmm. pressure for, as you said, because as they get colder, your PSIs can drop. And I'm a big proponent of manually checking tire pressure. Yes, I think most of the cars that we have, pretty well all the EVs out there have TPMS sensors in them, but I don't rely on those things at all. To me, they're just a guide. I, I kind of go out there once every couple of weeks and, and manually check my tire pressures with a very with the best gauge that I can get, that I can afford. Uh, some of those $5 you know, pocket ones aren't necessarily the most accurate. So it's, again, it's something that you might spend a little bit more money on, but I think it's so important to have proper tire pressure for many reasons. Yeah, and the other thing too is uh, a lot of people when they get winter tires, they don't want to spend the extra few hundred dollars to get the tire pressure sensors mm-hmm. installed right. in them. They only do it on the factory wheels that came with the vehicle. Mm-hmm. That's right. Um, I, I, which, I won't be. When I, I'll, yeah, I'll yeah. Like so I mean, in, in that not, case, you, you basically have to manually check them, yeah. right? So yeah. mm-hmm. um, I'm, I've already been noticing it now where um, my tires have gone down almost five PSI per mm-hmm. tire from, uh, from, say, like six weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, obviously, I've inflated them since then, but it, it can make a yeah. big difference. For sure. And then, as you said, when you're on those trips, you know, just keeping your speed, watching your speed. And part of that is safety. I mean, if the roads are slick, you don't want to be going uh, faster than the conditions allow. But even on dry roads, with that coldness, if you want to conserve some energy, just slow down a bit. Mm-hmm. Certainly helps. Now, what um, I know that I had some questions uh, by people as far as you know charging impact in the colder climates, and and um, you know if we have the luxury that we can park in a garage and charge at home, our you know uh, garages are fairly insulated to a point, so they won't get down really sub zero. They can get pretty cool, but um, uh, so you can charge in pretty good conditions there. But what about you know if you do have to fast charge or you, you're outside? What uh, how does how do the colds impact charging? Yeah, so I've actually been doing a little bit more uh, research into this, specifically towards the leaf, because I've had some questions around it as well. Um, but there were there were a few people that I spoke with, and they were very surprised that um, that regen would be limited. They didn't think mm-hmm. that regen would actually generate that much power. That they, to protect the battery, the vehicle would have to limit um, that power being sent back. So I do have uh, Leaf Spy, and mm-hmm. um, the max regen that I've been able to get, like just while using e-pedal, is about 37 kilowatts, about mm-hmm. 37 and a half kilowatts. Um, so keep in mind that the the Leaf is capable of fast charging at 50 kilowatts. So I mean, you're you're nearly there um, mm-hmm. just on regen alone. Um, but with the cold battery. Um, It'll, and I'm, I mean cold as in around zero degrees, like not minus 20. I haven't experienced mm-hmm. that yet, mm-hmm. um, but it'll only let you regen about 12 kilowatts. Wow. Okay. So less than half. Yeah. So about a third. Mm-hmm. Um, wow. I mean, the, the battery heats up fairly quickly, um, mm-hmm. again, just in these temperatures with regular driving. So once the internal temperature of the battery is around nine or 10 degrees, It'll allow the the full uh, regen amount, mm-hmm. but definitely when you're on a trip and you need to fast charge, um, like say say you were coming to Peterborough for the day, Ken, and mm-hmm. you didn't have any charging at your hotel and you had to fast charge to make it home again, mm-hmm. um, you would be better in that scenario to fast charge when you got to Peterborough because after just having driven. Um, the battery would be warm on the vehicle, right. so you would be able to fast charge at the full um, the full rate, essentially. Mm-hmm. If you were to, say you got here with 15%, and then you parked your car overnight, and it was the winter, and you went to fast charge in the morning, that fast charge would probably take you about three times longer because mm-hmm. it would be limited until the battery warmed up. Right. And that principle is with any uh, battery electric vehicle, not necessarily yep. just leaf, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Excellent. The, uh, the bolt that is around like 20 kilowatts as opposed to the 50. So again, you're looking at less than half mm-hmm. the speed. Right. So the best way to avoid that is by charging with a warm battery. Um, mm-hmm. You won't see, 
um, you won't see as big of an effect like if you're just charging at home on a level two because that you're only charging at about what is it 6.6 .6 or 7.2 mm -hmm. kilowatts yeah. anyways 38 30 32 to 40 some odd amps depending on what car you have mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so you won't see as big of an impact then, but you can definitely still see um, maybe a, an hour's difference between getting a full charge. Mm -hmm. And again, it's just it's more based on the efficiency at that point of the the colder battery. Right, right. And so uh, I always I, say yeah. if if you are even just going to a friend's house overnight, like if you can just plug into their garage running an extension cord or something, it's mm -hmm. going to be better than nothing because it'll at least maintain some heat in that, uh, in that battery. Exactly. Yeah. The, the level one trickle charge and, uh, it can help uh, at least keep something going on for that. So, so that's great. I think we've, we've covered a lot of the, uh, the questions that I know that I've been asked a lot recently regarding, you know, EVs in the winter. It's nothing that you should be scared about if you're an EV owner, it, you know, that they'll handle really well, as we've talked about. There's just some techniques that you can bring to bear to, to help make your driving experiences in the winter that much better, both from a handling perspective and a range perspective and a, and a comfort perspective. Uh, anything else you wanted to add to that, uh? In your findings, Spencer? Um, I don't think so. I guess mm -hmm. just a closing comment on it would be, I mean, it's it's really going to be no different than adjusting to driving an EV in the summer. Like if you say you got your EV in June, um, obviously it's a very uh, different use case than having a um, gas engine vehicle. Like you have yeah. to get yeah. used to charging at home and like learning about trip planning and that. So it's basically just sort of owning those skills and catering it to the winter. So with any vehicle, you're going to, you sort of learn the ins and outs of it the longer you own it, right? Um, Absolutely. This is going to be no different. Like there will be some things that probably surprise you, but then once you know about it, um, you know to expect that. So it's, uh, it's really nothing too, too crazy to get used to. That's right. I know you made a good good point. So, you know, I know that I'm sure that I have listeners on the podcast here that don't have EVs. So, you know, wanted to provide information as far as things that, that they may be thinking about that might discourage them from EV ownership, especially, you know, if they, if they live in, in more wintry conditions. That There's nothing that's going to hamper EV ownership that dramatically that you can't use these uh, these cars in the winter. And then if you do have one, hopefully some of the points we've talked about today have helped you uh, develop a bit more confidence and some techniques to be able to uh, to deal with your winter, especially if you're new. This will be my first new winter uh, uh, driving uh, my Leaf, so I'm certainly going to use a lot of these techniques uh, that are there. Now, a couple of things uh, I just want to talk about quickly before we close off and um, is really just kind of get your sense. There's a lot of scuttlebutt about the 60 kilowatt version, kilowatt hour leaf that uh, Nissan's supposed to come out with. I've heard unofficially that, you know, it will be uh, that size of a battery pack and have some sort of active uh, management, uh, cooling, I guess, uh, and, and the packs potentially coming from LG Chem. But are you aware of anything a little bit more concrete on that uh, the new leaf? Uh, no, nothing concrete, unfortunately. Um, All scuttlebutt and rumors kind of stuff? <laughs> that's what it seems like. I don't, yeah. I don't quite understand it because when the 2018 came out, they said that they were going to be coming out with the longer range one as the 2019 model year. But that's now, right. mm -hmm. again, unofficially, it sounds like what's happening is it's going to come out as like almost a 2019.5, like halfway yeah. through the model year. Yeah. Um. But I mean, for me personally, like it, uh, it wouldn't really change anything. The, right. the larger advantage for me would probably be the, the thermal management. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if I wanted to get a 60 kilowatt hour vehicle, I would have just bought a Bolt instead. Mm -hmm. But for the price range I was sort of looking in, um, right. I mean, even with the Leaf, again, it'll probably change a bit in the winter. But with my current routine, I charge about once a week. Um, so having 60 kilowatts would, yes, help me in the, the odd case, um, mm -hmm. when I do like a long trip, maybe once or twice a month. Mm -hmm. Um, but I haven't found the leaf, the 40 kilowatt hour leaf to be a burden, uh, in any sense. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've never really even been affected by rapid gate cause I haven't yet, uh, encountered a scenario where in a single day I needed to do. Uh, multiple 
rapid charges. So, um, mm-hmm. yes, I've had my battery get hot, but at no point has it um, really limited what I'm able to do. It's you know great viewpoints, and that's uh, something that I've talked uh, about on the show, on the video shows, on the YouTube shows, as well as in in, in you know to people in public that um, it, it, things tend to get overblown in the media. I try to be more biased, uh, to more to be excuse me, more non-biased and more objective in my reporting and, and balanced approach because there's always a pro and con to everything. And that when the whole rapid gate thing came out, it was really the this very small percentage of users that. Um, do a lot of heavy driving and that wanted that feature and thought that they could do it. And, you know, when, when they got throttled down and, and their distances increased a lot, um, they ran into those issues. But for the vast majority of BB, uh, bad electric owners like yourself and myself and others, you know, the Leaf as a particular model fits the bill from a budget and from a, uh, I haven't had an occasion yet to experience rapid gate either because I'm in the same scenario as you. I don't do, you know, a lot of long distance driving. And it, even if I do, I know what to expect. And I think the biggest failure on Nissan's point was just not properly articulating that message when they launched the car uh, about the feature. Uh, they call it a feature of throttling. I think had, and that's probably why people got more upset is because they were claiming misled. And yes, there there were some ads, I think, advertising in the UK that have been suspect to being a bit misleading. But I think if Nissan just, and now, uh, hopefully now they're doing it, they're just qualifying the buyers better. And they're, they're you know, first first question I ask somebody comes up to be looking for an electric car, I said, well, what are your, what's your driving habits? What's your daily ranges? What, do, you, do you drive a lot? You know, do you do a 500 mile trip every day or every week or every two weeks? I mean, that's the probing questions um, to start to to qualify that. Mm-hmm, for sure. Yeah, and I mean, the other thing to factor in too is um, like everybody is wanting this act of uh, thermal management, but mm-hmm. like I had spoken to earlier, um, active thermal management does consume power as mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. Um, so yes, you'll get a bigger battery that say, Again, again, it'll depend on the person, but for how often you need to do multiple fast charges consecutively mm-hmm. um, in the winter and in hot days on the summer and all that, like that, that liquid cooling system in the battery is going to consume power. Um, so it is going to uh, affect your range as well. Mm-hmm. And typically that's why you see, you've seen them more on, on larger battery pack sizes because... Yeah. No, yeah, I mean, if you have 60 kilowatts, definitely the, the draw from heating or cooling your battery is not going to be such a burden that it brings the range <laughs> down to a 40 kilowatt or something, but it is That's just right. something to uh, to factor yeah. in. No, good point. Good point. Well, listen, we've we've gone longer than I thought we were going to do on this topic because it was just so interesting, and, and it's very important to... Uh, to get this out, I know that when, when I reached out to you a couple of weeks ago about joining me on this podcast, and by the way, folks, I, I forgot to prep at the beginning that we were doing this through WebEx because we just physically couldn't connect up and meet up anywhere due to the distances. So hopefully the sound, hopefully this came out in, in pretty good quality overall. If not, I do apologize for maybe some interruptions that may have occurred. But, uh, you know, I want to, it was very important and timely because I've been getting a lot of emails and comments now about winter and, and how to how to EVs cope in the winter. So I, I and I know that Spencer had done some research and and was putting together some material to talk to people on that. So uh, I want to thank you a lot, uh, Spencer, for taking the time out of a, of a out of a family Sunday to join me here virtually um, on the Ideal Podcast to to tell me your experience and uh, the data that you've come up with in uh, in utilizing the the best abilities that you can from your Leaf and from a from a battery electric vehicle in the winter. Anything else you want to close off with? Uh, no, just thanks for having me and. Uh... I'm happy to help with any uh, information that I can share for others. Yeah. Well, I'll definitely. Obvi- obviously, I don't have a ton of winter driving experience from the yeah. motorcycle, so I sort of had yeah. to cater it to the leaf. Right. That's exactly it. Well, listen, I'm sure that we're we're going to re- you know recoup again on this uh, probably in the spring, and uh, you and I will both have a solid winter under our, under our belt to be able to compare notes and maybe maybe make some changes, uh, recommendations for next year. But I'm excited about looking forward to the winter. I mean, I, I I'm a four four season guy. I love all the seasons. 
here in Canada that we get. So a lot of people don't like the winter. I don't mind it at all. But I appreciate the, the, the time that you've spent, again, to put this information together and give us your, your, your findings and your personal experiences on this. So uh, appreciate it. Thank you very much, Spencer, for joining me. And for your listeners, again, thank you for tuning in to this edition uh, audio podcast number six of the EV Revolution show. Hope everybody does well and continue to please uh, follow me uh, on the YouTube channel as well, of course, at uh, EV Revolution show there. You can always reach me by email if you want to send in comments about the show. I'd love to hear from you. You could uh, record a comment and I can put it on air or I can, uh, if you want to do a video, I'll use it for one of my shows if you've got something you want to say or some questions. You can email me at evrevolutionshow at gmail.com and of course you can follow me on Twitter for uh, for whatever reasons you want to. I do try to get news information and articles and some opinions out on Twitter. Uh, at EV Rev Show is my Twitter handle. And if you're considering any sponsorship that you'd like to help uh, me out to continue doing what I'm doing here, you can look at my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash EV Revolution Show and check that out. And if you even a dollar uh, a dollar a month donation, every little bit helps and, and helps me to continue doing what I'm doing. So again, on behalf of, of myself and my listeners and viewers, um, Spencer, thanks a lot for taking the time out of your busy schedule to talk to me. Yeah, not a problem. Like I said, thanks for having me. Oh, you're quite welcome. And thanks, everybody, for listening. And until next time, stay safe, and we'll talk to you then. This episode of the EV Revolution Show is sponsored by File Sanctuary. Need a great web host for your business? Need to get email at yourdomain.com? They provide professional, feature-rich web and email hosting for any project you have in mind. Get started today at filesanctuary.net forward slash cloud and save 10% with promo code EVREVSHOW. Mm-hmm.